If we can have folks go ahead and get seated. All right, good morning and welcome to our third University Day community discussion. Thomas Edison started these in, uh, to honor our status moving to a university with the idea that let's have a day when we reflect on a discussion that brings together theory and practice in a way that is so true to everything Thomas Edison does. So today we're going to have something that is incredibly timely around kind of the intersection of civil and civic, I'm going to say, and how we look at that um, across different sectors. We have several panelists joining us. We've got our own academic side with Dr. Tara Kent, um, because what we do, as I said at Edison, is we work so hard to constantly infuse and move between that permeable membrane between practice and theory. And our students, our courses, everything we do keeps bouncing back between those. And we've recently redesigned a core class within our curriculum that focuses a lot on fact or fiction. And in today's world, fact or fiction plays up right up against civility, civic engagement, um, and where we go with that. And then we have two other leaders in their fields and practitioners who I won't introduce because I don't want to take that away from Dean Oliver. And with that, I will turn it over to Dean Oliver, who's Dean of the Watson School of Public Service. Thank you. Oh, no, uh, thank you. I'd first like to say it's an honor and a privilege to be here and thank everyone for coming out uh, this uh, morning. There was a little bit of drizzle, but it didn't stop anyone from coming out here. Uh, I'd also like to thank our, uh, our distinguished president, Dr. Meredith Hancock, um, Dr. Cynthia Baum, uh, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Marcella Maziars, Vice President for Community and Government Affairs, who reached out uh, to our panel and helped uh, bring this together. But also, behind the scenes, I'd like to thank uh, Misty Isaac, because she's been working with me for uh, quite a few weeks uh, on the behind the scenes um, uh, components of this. So I'm very thankful uh, to her. Why don't we give, her, give this team a round of applause. I'd also like to thank our guest panelists uh, uh, and uh, those seated in the audience, but we also have quite a few people joining us virtually, all right? So uh, at the end of the panel, we will take a couple of uh, some questions from the people who are joining us uh, virtually. Uh, again, my name is Malcolm Oliver. I serve as the Dean of the John S. Watson School for Public Service. Um, we uh, uh, have about 350 students in a variety of uh, masters, bachelor's and associate's degree programs. Uh, this topic that we're talking about today, which is informed civic engagement, discerning fact from fiction, cutting through the rhetoric, and understanding the value of our difference <laughs> is something that comes up uh, uh, and impacts policymakers and administrators on a day-to-day -day basis because as our economy has shifted uh, to the digital sphere, a lot of the information uh, that we get is digital. Um, and one of the uh, uh, key components of governance is the relationship between citizen and state. And underlying that, there's some uh, uh, level of trust that must be there. Um, so we're also talking about uh, trust between um, uh, citizen and state. We have a distinguished panel here. And I read their bios, and I said, I was so impressed. I said, you know what, let me just turn it over to them to introduce themselves, uh, <laughs> because my words will not be enough. Right. Skip, go. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Anthony Skip Cimino. Um, 74, 75 years ago, my mother decided to call me Skip, and that has stuck for uh, 75 years. So it's the power of a mother. Everybody should remember that. Um, I've had uh, the great opportunity to work in both the public and private sectors, uh, having uh, had my own business at one point, uh, having also been the president and uh, head of a major engineering company in the country, and thereafter coming back home to Hamilton Township uh, to be the uh, CEO and president of the Robert Wood Johnson Hamilton a hospital for a period of time. In addition to that, I had a public public service career. 
um, that serve that started with the service on the uh, Hamilton Township Board of Education. Uh, thereafter, I moved to uh, the county as a county freeholder and president of the freeholder board. Thereafter, into the assembly uh, as an assemblyman uh, and had the opportunity to uh, create law. Uh, one of the fine things I had the opportunity to work with uh, was with uh, John Watson, quite frankly, in securing these buildings uh, for, uh, for uh, Thomas Edison uh, in the earliest days. Uh, after a career in uh, public, uh, or excuse me, in private uh, enterprise and what have you, uh, you know, you get out of the public service and you think you're done, and just when you think you're done, they call you back in. And uh, so I was fortunate to go to work for Speaker Craig Coughlin, who is still the Speaker, and I spent four years as the Executive Director of the General Assembly and worked very closely with my colleague Kevin Drennan. Uh, in the in the Senate. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm Kevin Drennan. Uh, I'm working my career to catch up to all the things Skip has accomplished. Um, so I, I've started, uh, my parents were always very active and civically uh, engaged um, and it was sort of just born into me. Uh, as, I, as I've said recently, uh, we watched election returns and State of the Union addresses like we like people would watch blockbuster movies. Uh, that's the kind of house I grew up in. Um, and I started early on doing campaigns, uh, which I've done a lot of over career of my career, including uh, U.S. Senate campaigns, gubernatorial campaigns, um, and uh, I'm back doing that again uh, all over the country. Um, but then I went in to work for Governor McGreevy, U.S. Senator Corzine, Governor Corzine. I served as Executive Director of the State Commerce Commission um, and then went into the private sector myself. Um, and then uh, with probably a shorter amount of time than Skip, but got pulled back in and served as Chief of Staff and Executive Director to Senate President Sweeney uh, for 10 years. So uh, he was the longest serving Senate President um, and I was lucky enough to serve for most of that time and then spent six months transitioning uh, the new Senate President Scutari uh, before leaving and now entering back into the private sector um, where I'm a contract lobbyist. Uh, I also work, as I mentioned, I uh, work with a firm where we do national political consulting, but we also have a firm that we started called the Civic Operations Group, which will, uh, I think is pertinent to today's conversation. Uh, and then I work in doing some water infrastructure uh, and sewer infrastructure with a company called American Public Infrastructure. Uh, so that's what I do now, and I'm also the chair of Mercer County Community College. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tara Kent, and I'm currently serving as the associate dean in the Haven School of Art, Sciences, and Technology, and I'm also the director of undergraduate studies at the university. I oversee all of the university's liberal arts programs at both the undergraduate and graduate level. And I followed a somewhat traditional academic trajectory. I uh, was on faculty at a number of institutions and um, true to some of our purpose today, I entered into academic administration as a way to almost um, put praxis to my theory and um, much of my career that we'll probably talk about today has been focused on promoting access to higher education opportunities for um, groups who haven't always had that opportunity. Um, I have degrees in psychology, uh, sociology, anthropology, and um, gender studies from the University of Delaware and Purdue University and I've served on um, faculty at uh, the University of Delaware and Washington College, um, and I've taught a breadth of courses in the social sciences. So we'll talk a little bit more about how the social sciences have this um, relationship with politics. So as we can see, we have a very distinguished and knowledgeable panel here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just jump right into the questions. Uh, and the first one, I'm going to throw over, uh, throw over to Dr. Kent. 
Uh, can you just discuss the role of the university in specifically addressing this uh, issue of misinformation? Certainly. Um, well, many of us and educators and researchers and of course my colleagues today um, will talk a great deal more about this, but we have um, all become increasingly concerned about the impact of widespread misinformation and the incredible power of dissemination through varied forms of media and social media. Um, we're all bombarded on a daily basis with information, but few of us are very well equipped to fully um, discern reliable sources of information and differentiating fact from fiction. This concern is further heightened when misinformation plays a role in the decisions that we make that are important like our health or who we'll vote for to represent us in government and um, draft policy on our behalf. So um, the university has been responsive to this um, concern and I was fortunate to work with a highly talented team of academics at the university to design a new course titled Fact, Fiction, or Fake Information Literacy Today. And the course learning outcomes directly respond to these topics and include the use of information literacy and critical thinking skills to identify, locate, evaluate, and effectively use and share information. The course further explores the ways that biases can impact the way that we respond to information and why it is that so many people will dismiss information even when it's credible, when it runs counter to what they already think or believe. And this type of um, confirmation bias is particularly heightened today in our social media environment based on the way that algorithms work on most um, social media platforms. So the course is focused on giving students ways to really navigate that terrain and unpack um, some of the information that's coming at us on a regular basis. Additionally, the course focuses on building written and verbal communication skills in academic professional and personal environments. And this information literacy course, as the president mentioned, is um, a requirement for all degree-seeking students at the university. It's a part of the foundation of our general education program and all students are expected to <coughs> successfully complete this course. And with this course, we're striving to cultivate in our students sound research skills and develop informed, critical thinkers who are in turn productive and informed communicators, decision makers, as well as responsible citizens. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kent. I, I, I really appreciate that because your remarks, they speak directly to the theme of University Day uh, and about building bridges through civil, uh, civic discourse and engagement. Now, this next uh, uh, question is really uh, uh, sent over to Mr. Drennan and Mr. Semino. And I wanted to, to ask, in your prior roles, have you had to address misinformation? And if so, what are some of the most effective processes uh, that you have seen to identify factual information and to help communicate policies? So, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the first thing, there, the first thing that comes to mind, which is even relevant today, but it, it happened prior to, to COVID, uh, is that the legislature was contemplating um, a, uh, you know, the, to take away what is commonly known as a religious exemption, um, uh, which is more of a conscientious objector ob exemption on vaccines for uh, students going into public education. And, you know, we were, you know, crowded in the halls, uh, you know, outside of the state house, and it, it, certainly people can have their opinion of of what whether or not they believe their child should be 
uh, vaccinated or not, but it, the, the amount of uh, misinformation or disinformation that we got, and it came from different fields. One of the leading people uh, on the issue that people were using as their source was a chiropractor uh, from South Jersey who had no pharmaceutical experience, no uh, epidemiology experience, and they were saying, well, this doctor uh, is, is saying this. Now, if the other problem with that is that's actually a violation of, of medical ethics, uh, being able to, uh, you know, indicate uh, a medical procedure or medical uh, decisions for, you know, suggesting that to people when you don't have that experience. And so, and then even with that, then there was the constitutional aspect of it as to whether or not uh, it was constitutional for us to do what we were doing. Now, interestingly enough, it was only roughly uh, 20 years ago where we didn't have this exemption and actually came in. Uh, that, that law that got passed to, that allowed a more conscientious objector was, I believe, under Governor Corzine at the time, and we were actually just changing what, what that was. In addition to that, there's a lot of constitutional law uh, and, and court decisions that have allowed for the purposes of vaccines for the protection of the general health. So to, your, to go then on your question, that's the analysis, but to go to answer your question, it's, you're never going to convince those people. Uh, right, those that are misinformed who choose to, to have the confirmation, you know, follow the confirmation bias. So for us, in my, in my former role, it's, it's about educating the individual members and, try and getting them to understand what the facts are um, and trying to cut through that and su supplying them with the medical research, right, from the appropriate primary sources, the, the court cases that, that back up the constitutionality of what we were trying to do um, and the history. All that being said, I can tell you I was able to convince 21 uh, senators, but I wasn't able to convince 21 senators to vote for it. Uh, and, and, the, and the issue failed because it's one thing for them to understand it and to try to cut through it, but they get elected by their, their constituents. And so it's not just who, and a lot, most of our interaction in our former possession was with the individual legislators, but a lot, it's the education that has to get down to the general public. and. I give you that example, we weren't able to cut through that in that example, uh, unfortunately, and, and now there still is the, the ability to have the conscientious objection. And, and the problem with that, and the reason why we're trying to correct this, as you may know, is that vaccination rates for um, you know, measles, uh, smallpox, other, other uh, vaccines are declining to a level below uh, herd immunity. Um, so it's starting to become a more of a public health concern. Uh, then this goes way beyond just the COVID vaccine. So. Well, I, let me let me just pick up on that point that Kevin spoke because we also, uh, as the assembly, dealt with uh, the vaccine question. And similar to what Kevin is saying, uh, when we were um, looking at the the vaccine question and the conscientious objector phase of it, uh, it was not only the issue of those who came from the outside to express their opinion, which obviously they're entitled to do. I mean, this is part of our democracy and, and we should listen to everybody's opinion on things. Uh, but there was a good deal of, of uh, disinformation uh, and misinformation, quite frankly, that was applied. And it was applied not only uh, external to the Assembly Caucus, it also happened inside the caucus, which uh, when you look to pass legislation, you need to have in the General Assembly, you need to have 41 votes that will support it. And as Kevin said, um, while he convinced uh, a number of senators that it was the right thing, uh, they could not get over the hump of uh, getting uh, the, uh, the, the required number to get it through. We, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, we had a different experience on this with regard to the conscientious objector piece of it. We, in fact, did pass it in the assembly. Uh, and we did that, uh, quite honestly, even though we had one of them, our members' daughters in the crowd outside objecting strenuously to uh, what, we were, what we were doing and what have you. Um, and it put that particular assembly person in a very, very difficult position because uh, he understood uh, what he had done for his children along the way. Uh, and at the same time, his daughter wanted nothing to do with it. 
So uh, we, in fact, uh, did deal with it. Um, we allowed people in. We allowed people into the gallery, uh, in the assembly. We allowed them to stand outside and, and uh, respond and what have you. Because people have a right, regardless of whether we think they are on the same path or the right path, they have a right in this democracy to express their views uh, and what have you, short of hollering fire in a, <laughs> in a crowded room uh, and what have you. And so we managed to convince uh, the overwhelming majority that we needed, and we ended up with, uh, out of the 54 members of the Democratic majority, quite frankly, 49 of them voting to pass, pass this uh, legislation. Uh, on uh, on that. The, the other issue I would say to you that has been um, a real challenge has been so much, <clears throat> excuse me, of the misinformation about guns and taking care of gun control. Um, the, uh, the opposition has uh, clearly espoused the Second Amendment mm -hmm. as a way for everybody to have a gun and there's no way that we should have any kind of level of gun control. And that was a very, very challenging and difficult uh, position for us to contend with as we did a number of, uh, of uh, things that were important where gun control was concerned. I, I remember back when I was an assemblyman and Governor Florio was the governor and um, we decided that we would ban assault weapons, the infamous AR-15 in the state of New Jersey. I will tell you that was probably one of the most extraordinary days that I spent in my life in government. Um, there were people outside the state house. Windows were broken into the state house. State police had to guard all of us uh, in, in terms of what we were doing. But in the final analysis, we passed an assault weapons ban which still exists in New Jersey, uh, and I think has been something that has helped us uh, maintain uh, law and order uh, in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way uh, with, regard to, uh, with regard to the state of New Jersey. So this is um, certainly a question that um, I would take a very different approach and have a very different experience. And in some respects, it's when I reflect on um, the privilege of being a part of an educational community. And as an educator, it's my role and responsibility to teach students about scientific research methodologies um, and to present them with empirical evidence and sound research findings that are published in peer-reviewed journals um, or other reliable outlets for information. So um, it's a very different um, role, but also a very significant responsibility. And in so doing, um, we hope that our students are building skills to use that evidence um, to weigh decisions and um, make informed choices. Um, so I, in terms of a classroom setting, um, I also think that we're in a um, position where it's necessary to present data, theory, and research in very neutral ways. Um, so it's never really um, a good idea for an instructor to bring in a specific um, political stance or philosophical position in the classroom. Um, but at the same time, I will admit that um, I, as a social problem sociologist, I am often dealing with very uh, difficult, challenging, controversial topics that um, are not always familiar to students when they enter into the classroom. And I know that I am working sometimes against some of those preconceived notions or belief systems <coughs> when students come into the classroom. So I have um, 
needed to um, rise to the occasion, so to speak, and be very prepared with um, research to cite sources and then discuss differing theories and perspectives. And once I've done this, I've, in a sense, empowered the students to know how to seek out that kind of information and um, use their critical thinking skills to make the best um, possible decisions and um, weigh um, varied arguments. So um, this approach, at least in the classroom, um, for me has worked well and has worked well for my students. Thank you, Dr. Kent. Uh, in the field of public administration, there's this concept of, called the politics administration dichotomy. Now, there's no clear line between politics and administration, but um, what I wanted to say is that uh, at the local, state, and federal level, there's this army of uh, 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 administrators who spend a lot of time, energy, and resources of, uh, uh, collecting data, analyzing it, putting the facts uh, together, and putting together and some summizing the information in these reports that go to these elected officials. Um, uh, now, um, if, the, if the, the elected officials, they're elected as part of the democratic process, they can take the information or they may not take it, but it's felt by most administrators, at least I did my job by providing that information. However, um, uh, uh, we, 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 uh, especially Kevin, you kind of brought up something that information can be provided, but some of the uh, uh, decision makers they can take it, or they may not uh, take it because of, of political calculation. Um, there's some level of trust somewhere in there. So th this kind of leads to my next uh, question about consensus building um, for effective governance. And can um, uh, uh, this for... Uh, Kevin and Skip, can you share an example of when you had to use a consensus building skill to move a decision forward? Sure. Um, I think uh, the, the, uh, the, the most recent uh, consensus building skill that we needed to utilize was, quite frankly, on the issue of cannabis, mm -hmm. social equity, those who had uh, gone to jail uh, for, uh, for using cannabis uh, and the overwhelming number of people that went to jail under those were black and brown people versus white people. And so dealing with the issue of cannabis and whether in fact it was a good thing for New Jersey to um, promote and to legalize, uh, there was a great deal of consternation about that. And, you know, the, the, the law enforcement community was uh, very much uh, not in favor of uh, some of the things that uh, we were suggesting that would go into the bill. Um, it took us a long time. Um, Kevin and I, uh, quite frankly, with leaders, and I mean leaders, I'm talking about Senator Scutari, Speaker Coughlin, we spent a summer uh, in in the in the uh, conference rooms, uh, trying to determine how we would do this, uh, question arose as to universities. Uh, universities did not want us to allow it on their campus, and at the same time, universities wanted to understand whether they could do research. So it was an extraordinarily complicated issue, coming from various. Places and then, of course, there were the there was the outside interest of those who were supportive of cannabis, who just said, "Well, just just get us a bill, you know, and um, what have you." And oh, by the way, we want to do homegrown, and the leadership did not want to do homegrown uh, and what have you. And rather than the legislature be responsible for every piece of it, we came to a consensus. Uh, among the leadership as well of developing a commission that would handle it. Now we had to take this to uh, our, our representatives in terms, of, in terms of the elected officials, in my case in the assembly, 
Uh, and not everybody was necessarily on board from the very, very beginning. And so we had to convince assembly people that it was the right thing to do from a social equity perspective, that from a legalization perspective, other states, uh, and we, we drew on the experiences of Colorado, Massachusetts, Vermont, uh, as to what they, what they had done. Uh, and we, we moved forward with this to build a consensus that yes, we should pass this legislation and we should, we should move forward. Um, at some point it was determined rather than it just go through the legislature on its own and be signed by the governor, it was put up to the general public in the form of a public question. The public question passes 66% to 33% overwhelmingly, so we should have a cannabis bill, right? No, that did not happen. <laughs> we then had to go back to the drawing board and we had to work uh, through some of the law enforcement aspects of the bill and it wasn't for almost a year after the question was passed by the public that we ultimately arrived at a consensus for both houses as well as the administration because there's another piece to what we did it's called the governor's administration and in New Jersey the governorship is the most one of the most powerful governorships in the country maybe the only one that's more is equal to its power is that of California and what happened. but ultimately we did arrive in uh, the beginning of 21 I believe uh, where we finally made it legal to have cannabis in the state of New Jersey yeah uh, and uh, th that was an experience in of itself the experience I had similar to that and and it's happened several times um, but I think the the most uh, one uh, comparable to legalization of cannabis was the elimination of cash bail, uh, something that the legislature had worked on for several years. And it also took a constitutional question that actually required a constitutional uh, question to go to the voters because uh, the Constitution required cash bail be an option. And it, we were approaching with two very different uh, issues. Um, when we eliminated uh, capital punishment in the state of New Jersey, the, the legislature death, we did removed it from the Constitution. The, we failed to recognize that um, we had the ability in the Constitution to hold people of very serious crimes, those facing capital punishment, in jail without the option of bail. Well, when, the problem was when you eliminated capital punishment, everybody, because we didn't change that language, everybody then was at a lot out. So you could have terrorists a lot out, you could have drug kingpins a lot out, anybody, they all had to now have the option of bail. So on one side, uh, there was, you know, from the more conservative side, it's like, wait a second, we should not be allowing these individuals to have the option of cash bail, so we need to eliminate that. Um, we also had the, uh, the reality that we were holding people for $500, $1,500 in, in jails, pre-trial, um, so non-convicted because uh, they couldn't afford it. Um, they couldn't afford the cash bail and, you know, and so there was the side that we need to get rid of that. But the question then was how do you balance the ability to both hold people in jail um, pre-trial who you want to, who are very dangerous, while allowing individuals out of, out of jail who are, who are a lot less dangerous, who probably wouldn't serve any time even if they were convicted, uh, on what they were in, in jail for pre-trial. And so you had conservatives, you had the police, you had the ACLU, you had the NAACP, you had the Black Issues, uh, uh, and then you had the bail bondsmen as well, and of all these variety of interests, and we were trying to, and all of our members had different reasons to agree with individuals in, in all of the camps. And interestingly enough, while with the NAACP, the Black Issues Convention, the ACLU all got on board with the direction we were moving in, with, which was the elimination of cash bail and allowing uh, for people to be detained uh, without the option of bail, but with the, uh, what we, we created, I forget what we call it, but a, an algorithm that would then determine whether or not people should be detained pre-trial or post-trial. The ACLU, the NAACP, they all agreed. 
the Black Caucus did not agree. So now you had an issue where, you know, advocacy groups who largely advocate on behalf of, of minorities and specifically uh, the black community were all on board with the direction we were going to move forward. But the, uh, the Black Caucus, the members that were African American and black in the legislature were against it. And they were against it because they were afraid that black and brown people would be, you know, further detained without any option of, of getting out. Um, so it took, uh, I, I always remind myself, it was like a boxing match. It, I, I kept going into meetings uh, and, and, you know, ending the, the meetings with, with no agreement, going back to the center president and say, this is never going to get done, and him saying, schedule another meeting, you're going to get this done, and, and, and you go back in. And eventually there was, a, there, we, we had, and every branch of government was involved. Uh, it was a, a report that came out of the, um, the judiciary led by Chief Justice Stuart Rabner. Um, so we had the judiciary involved, the legislature involved, the governor's office involved, the attorney general's office involved. And it was a lot of the meetings, and we, without going into every piece of policy, there was a, a lot of aspects of the bill that ultimately changed, that brought everybody on board. And what I believe is, and you you've may have seen it, a lot of us, we just went through the campaigns, where especially in Pennsylvania for those in South Jersey, and actually in, in New York, I guess they were going through it too, with Governor Hochul's election, about bail reform. And Pennsylvania and, and New York have had problems with it that we, quite honestly, have not had here because of how we went through it. So there, there were issues early on with um, the graves uh, crimes, which are gun crimes, uh, which were able to be fixed without legislation, just through regulation and to not have as many people back on the streets who were convicted with a gun crime because that did ultimately lead to violent crimes, that, just as an example. But ultimately, recidivism has gone down. You know, there's no r real increase of any crimes being committed by people who were released pre-trial than before when we had bail. And as I always remind everybody, Everybody was allowed out. It's just whether or not you could have bail. It's not it, the, our former thing didn't didn't allow anybody to be completely detained. Whereas now we actually have that option. So in some ways we have a, a stronger option. But it, you know we had a balance of two issues, and it, I, it took us I don't know I think I want to say three years to yeah. to get that to get that done where we were uh, very heavily involved on it, and we were the first state in the nation to to eliminate the cash bail and and move forward. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Skip, uh, Kevin. Those are some major issues that you just talked about. Uh, uh, cannabis and cash bail are some of the uh, uh, biggest social equity issues uh, that we have in our nation. Uh, they deal with race, they deal with class, um, and uh, even though the data has been there for quite some time, uh, political action has been <coughs> limited. Um, uh, but progress has been made. Um, with that being said, as a university, sometimes these things play out in the classroom with the material that we go over. And I wanted to uh, send over a question to Dr. Kent. Uh, how does this play out in the classroom? Going over complicated issues, and our students are very diverse, and they bring their own perspectives, and you're the sociologist, they bring their own perspectives into the classroom. Uh, what, are some of the, what are some of the things that have come up, and how do you manage that? Well, definitely um, consensus building and partisanship aren't directly related to the work that we're involved in in the classroom, um, but certainly, um, as I was describing before, biases and preconceived notions um, that students bring with them do. And so, um, again, I think that it's really most effective to give students um, a perspective about um, what some of the data says, give them um, a varied approaches uh, using theory to um, weigh some of those varied options. And um, it is, I think, um, a tremendous um, responsibility on the part of an educator to approach these kinds of issues in the classroom so that we know that our students are well prepared for um, voting decisions that they make. And so um, maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why I um, entered into um, public higher education and um, some of that relationship we were talking about before. and. Um, 
I, I am a social problem sociologist. And so my work um, explores the relationship between social inequalities and um, social demographics by race, class, and gender. And all of the research shows that education um, is one of the most effective means by which a person can alter their life chances and uh, disrupt cycles of inequity. Um, for example, um, all um, Bureau of Labor Statistics consistently show that as educational attainment increases, so do wages and salaries and unemployment rates decline. Um, so education is a way to um, promote upward uh, social mobility and disrupt the cycle of poverty. Education is also a highly effective way to confront uh, popular uh, misconceptions about marginalized groups of people which play a role in perpetuating inequality. And um, it further can um, promote acts of uh, hate-motivated violence. So as a sociologist, I know that um, participating in the educational process can have a very real impact on addressing some of these issues that we're talking about today and um, uh, impacting change <coughs> in our society and um, disrupting some of the social inequalities that we deal with. Um, I will also add that um, I see education as um, playing a extremely important role in advancing American democracy. Um, a functioning democracy is wholly dependent upon an informed citizenry. That is what um, democracies, um, how they function, and um, it's completely dependent upon um, participation on the part of citizens who are paying attention and aware of these social issues and capable of making um, intelligent and informed decisions about um, choosing elected officials who will represent them and make poli policy decisions on their behalf. And each vote is truly um, a statement about the type of society that you want to live in. So um, I think that um, these are um, issues that we're always grappling with in the classroom, and it's um, certainly an effective way to ensure that our students, as they move forward and make some of these decisions, that they at least are armed with the skills to weigh some of um, these issues and use re uh, reasoned arguments for why they might take a position that they do. Right, thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, what I wanted to do is uh, I want to switch gears just a little bit and throw one more question out, but I wanted to leave room uh, for questions from the audience or from anyone uh, that's online. Uh, but I, I kind of, we're talking about uh, uh, public service, information, disinformation, um, and uh, uh, th th there's a little bit of an ethical issue here. Um, uh, and I kind of wanted to turn it over uh, and ask, um, uh, especially Kevin and Skip, and then Dr. Kim, how do your personal ethics inform your decision making on major issues? Because it's not just about information that you receive, it's what you do with that information. I, what I would say, from from the position that I w used to be in, right? So, in personal, I mean, I I had a lot of personal opinions, probably a lot of personal biases. I worked for the Senate President and and, and as well as the Senate Caucus, the Senate Democratic Caucus. Um, 
I had to put my personal opinions in aside. Uh, you know, I synthesize what information I was given, understand their perspective, most importantly, uh, in, in my role as executive director of the Senate president, um, and, you know, and then reflect uh, his point of view. Um, so, I mean, it's a good, you know, and we're, I would say that his, you know, personal ethics were very high. Um, I would say that the caucus's personal ethics were very high. But as a staffer and the person responsible for getting the information and prior to the uh, the elected official, there, there are definitely times where, um, you know, I disagreed, uh, you know, with the direction that we were going in. But that uh, was not my job. My job was not to reflect what what my opinion of the matter was. It was to reflect what what again the Senate President and the Executive Director, uh, sorry, and the Caucus uh, direction wanted to go in. And I had a great staff as well that I worked with, and and there were many times they were in the same uh, situation that I found myself in, um, and they were great. But you know, I think our perspective, it's not as though we don't get to provide a perspective, but our opinion doesn't just drive the decision. Um, and, you know, I had some members on my staff who were definitely more liberal, some who were more conservative, uh, some were more academic, some were more practical. Uh, and I, I don't, you know, and I drove uh, as far as the executive director to, to try to get them to remove their personal opinions, but to have their personal experiences still reflect uh, the, you know, uh, what we were working on and, and how we were making decisions. Fortunately, as well, from that time to time, you are asked your personal opinion by the Senate President, by members of the Senate, and at which time we gave, you know, would give it. But we would only give it, uh, or I, and I should say I would only give it when I was asked uh, in those situations of what my personal opinion is and, and what it should be reflected. Um, what I did provide them is, uh, regardless of how I felt about a personal issue, uh, which was a big part of the job, which is how the, their, uh, their individual, because we represent all different legislative districts, how their individual constituencies may respond and to why. Um, that was something that I felt was, as executive director, was my responsibility, both how would this affect the caucus, how would it affect them individually. That doesn't always mean that's the, you shouldn't always make a decision based on how your electorate is, is going to be reflective, but it was something we, we added into it. Um, I'm not sure if that directly answers your question. It's a tough question. No, <laughs> Hopefully I gave Skip enough time to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Kev. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I would, I would agree. I mean, in terms of, in terms of uh, personal ethics, uh, there were points of time uh, in the uh, in the assembly where I did not agree with with uh, the direction, but uh, quite frankly, that wasn't my that wasn't my choice. My choice was to ensure that the staff and, like Kevin, I had both liberals as well as conservatives and academics uh, on the staff. Uh, great, I had a great team, um, but the goal was to provide the information and to make sure that the legislators, uh, in fact, had the information, regardless of what my personal opinion may have been and what have you. So from an ethical perspective, my job was to ensure that the process of government moved forward in the assembly executive director's job. I also had another job in government uh, at one point where I was the commissioner of personnel, which is the civil service system. I was head of the civil service system, and as commissioner, I was at the level of a superior court judge. So when there were questions of uh, concern relative to employees uh, throughout the entirety of the state workforce, um, quite frankly, some of, those, uh, some of those employees ran into difficulties, uh, and those cases would appear before myself as well as the Merit System Board. And regardless of what I might have thought personally, I had to put aside my personal opinions uh, relative to a potential issue and rule on the basis of the facts. The facts. Regardless of what I might have thought should have happened, it had to be based on the facts and what have you. Uh, and so consequently, 
because of that, I think that you develop over time an understanding that um, we all have our personal opinion, we're all entitled to our personal opinion, but at the end of the day, we have to do what's right to move government forward in an appropriate process and what have you. Excellent, excellent. I think uh, uh, in a way that is an administrative ethic, um, uh, 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 putting personal bias aside, you using uh, the data that you gather to, to assemble evidence and then uh, making a rational decision based upon the facts that have pre been presented and within the law, uh, mm -hmm. uh, within the scope of the law. Uh, Dr. Kent, how does it play out in the um, classroom or through teaching? Uh, well, I think that um, I have always attempted to maintain a sense of truth to my own ethical core. And um, in terms of the position of being an ethical educator, um, that's our training is to um, pursue knowledge and pursue truth. And so um, it's, as I was saying earlier, it's always the case that each of us has an opinion or that we've drawn some conclusions, but that, that is not my role in the classroom. I've always considered it to be um, a success if the students didn't know where I actually stood on an issue after we'd been debating about it for an entire semester. And I would often have students ask me at the end of class, well, what do you really think about thus and so? Because that's a part of the style that I developed um, is to attempt to remove myself, understand who my students are and where they're coming from and to work with them from that standpoint with information and um, research really leading the, the conversation. So um, as an ethical educator, that's how I would, I would put it, is focus on the pursuit of knowledge. Okay, okay, okay. Dr. Kent, um, what I wanted to do now is turn it over to the audience, see if we have a couple of questions, and or, uh, if not in the room, uh, online. How about anyone in the room? You've been sitting here <laughs> listening, pondering. I've seen a lot the of smiles. I have a question for you. Yes. How do you handle it when you have the science, but you also have history? So if we want to go back to vaccines, something like that. So you have the science, hmm? but you have a lot of trust that's based on historical fact as well. How, how do you, because that's a real passionate, emotional space. How do you handle that both in your chambers mm -hmm. or in your caucus, but also then with your constituents? Any thoughts on that from so the it, practitioners? <laughs> so it's, it's I, I think, I mean, that's probably something you face with almost every piece of legislation, right? There's always, you know, I, I've, you know, I haven't been doing it as, as long as Skip, but I've spent a lot of time in Trenton in the last 25 years. Uh, and, I, you know, people are always like, how do you know so much about, you know, X and Y, Z issue? And I'm like, well, because in 25 years, these are the same issues, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah, exactly. They come back in different ways. So there's, and, and different, you know, I'm trying to think of a, of a good, I mean, one of the interesting ones, and it, 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 it's not as a social issue, but when we did the higher education restructuring, higher education restructuring was something that uh, when I first started under Governor McGreevy, he tried to do uh, and, and, and failed to accomplish um, it, when he was attempting to do it. Uh, as many of you may recall, there was issues with uh, the University of Menace medicine and dentistry in New Jersey and um, there was always a need to, to do something from that point in time when the federal uh, government got involved and uh, we didn't get there until we got to uh, there under uh, Governor Christie and one of the biggest issues uh, on right on the historical side I guess if you will uh, from you know from the facts right so the facts are we were going to be better off if we if we made Rutgers specifically Rutgers uh, a bigger university, bringing medicine into it, we had more ability to do, to bring in research dollars. 
But then yet, arguably the history there, which was complicated, was a lot of the, the successorship, as I'm putting it, union issues, right? Where, you know, you had a lot of union contracts uh, that you had to deal with as you were merging entities uh, together and how you had to deal with that. I mean, it, it, it's complicated to sum up in a, a couple of minutes, but you, there, I think that that is sort of, you know, but and that's what complicated it. And I think that it ultimately sometimes, I mean, you know, uh, those two things may never be resolved, meaning, right, the fact that th th that was going to I mean everything could have still fallen apart, even though I think a lot of the facts were on our side and we did succeed, but everything could have fallen apart because of people uh, and, um, you know, people were afraid of what the change would be and what that would mean to sort of the historical nature, you know, of, you know, faculty and, and staff. Um, and they don't, facts don't always prevail. They happen to, I think, in that time. And I think it was, I think we've all hopefully agree that it, it was good for the state of New Jersey. It was good, um, you know, for, and, and there was a lot of work that was done to, to bring the unions along to, to reflect what, you know, Again, the history, the historical nature of what the, they were and, and what they mean to the university. So, I, again, it's hard to explain. I guess that's sort of the best one I can come up with from the you know two things where things did change over time. But you know, everything. Um, I mean, cannabis legalization, uh, you know, had been around since. I mean, for at least 10, 15 years, right? I'm right. sure you know. Right. Uh, I mean, I don't, I couldn't tell you how long. Right, cash, uh, cash bail has been a problem in this country. Right, probably since you know we started with it. There was people held uh, on cash bail who shouldn't have been held on cash bail. There's, uh, there's constant issues, and facts don't. Uh, are, are no matter what facts, uh, facts certainly do drive policy. It's, and it goes back. It's the to your point. It's the constituents who. It's the constituents who move things forward. If you don't have an educated citizenry, right, and we, you know, on the issues. It's hard to move things forward. It doesn't matter how much the, the members, the legislators, you know, they are represent those who, who elect them. And unless you're making the effort to educate the citizenry, everything is slow, um, which is the way our country is founded. But that we need to do more, and we've lost this, social media especially, but we need to do more to engage individuals uh, on civic issues and understand them as civic issues, not as political issues, um, that people should just be engaged. Not everything needs to be political. Um, and we've now made everything political. Um, I, I don't know how you undo that. I'm not saying I have a solution. But <laughs> again, so. Well, I, you know, I think that's a, mm -hmm. a very, very interesting question. Uh, I was a history major in college and graduate school and what have you, and uh, I, I think uh, what Kevin has said about uh, civic engagement is very, very important. I think in large measure we've lost a good deal of civic engagement in, in our country, and we've become divided uh, in a, a number of different areas uh, over, over time. There's, there's no question about it. But if you, if you look at the history of the country, and if you have a realistic view of the history of the country, and where the country has been, and where the country needs to go, um, the Founding Fathers made an extraordinary document in the Constitution. And it wasn't made just for 1789. It was a document that was made to fulfill the, the benefits of democracy over the course of time and what have you. And over the course of time, things have changed dramatically. And so we need to look at what the history has been as to how we've gotten here. But, you know, among all of us, who, who 15 years ago had a cell phone that had a camera? Uh, who 15 years ago had a computer, necessarily, uh, and what have you? And so, um, it's important that we uh, understand our history, but it's equally important through uh, civic engagement that we move our country forward. And as it relates to the political process, the fact is 
having been an elected official, at the end of the day, the currency for elected officials is the voter, is the voter, not the lobbyist, <laughs> not the, the, the TV station or what have you. It is the voter. It is the person who goes out and expresses their viewpoint at the polls and what have you. So for there to be an informed citizenry, I think it's very, very important for us as we continue to move forward uh, as, a, as a country. Uh, Dr. Kent, what are, what are your thoughts uh, about this with, with regard to higher education leadership? Well, I think that um, maybe I'll shift it a little bit and I'll say at least that um, as a sociologist, we consider history data. <laughs> mm -hmm. And history is necessary um, to understand and to also honor. And so I think to the president's question, um, that's also necessary to recognize that there were um, times in our history where there are reasons why certain um, constituent groups may be distrustful. And that's um, a, an important part of this process of helping any citizen to um, understand that there's um, honesty in the way that we're presenting information and we're honoring that, that history. Um, but to my colleague's point, um, I think we're all very much on the same page that that also requires <coughs> an ongoing educational process as well. To honor that history and to talk about um, whatever the um, process had been in terms of developing um, a vaccine and what was involved in order to gain some, some sense of trust uh, amongst the, the citizens. So um, I'm just very grateful to hear from my colleagues how um, committed they are to um, civic issues and um, the role that education plays in um, enabling each of us to go forward and participate in um, democracy in an informed way. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kemp. Uh, uh, Dr. Hancock? All right, thank you. Thank you, um, Dean Oliver, and our three distinguished guests. I think you know, we have our challenges cut out for us. I do, I like how the conversation ended because I think somehow cutting through the rhetoric to appreciate where people come from, and if we look at uh, the cosmology of um, civil, civic, I come from Latin civis, which is around citizen, and that educated citizenry uh, you know, you'd always rather argue with somebody who's educated than somebody who's not. And um, you realize that, maybe you rethink it as your kids get older, but, but it's always a better argument when you're working with somebody who's educated and knows the facts and can make a co cohesive and cogent kind of argument and you can better understand where they're coming from and vice versa. So I thank our panel, we appreciate your time and to our virtual audience as well, thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, gentlemen.